morning, guys. Um, as Annie said, I'm Rob. Um, it's really great to be with you. Just a little bit about myself before we start. Um, so I'm a PE teacher by trade. Um, I've got a beautiful wife called Ruth, and we have uh, an adorable, wonderful little baby girl called Esther, who's about five and a half months now. Um, so um, as Andy said, we're going to be starting a new sermon series today. We're looking at heroes of the Old Testament, and they've asked me to speak about Samson, uh, which is a great story. I'm still sure many of you are kind of familiar with it. We're going to look at some different aspects of it today. But before we do that, I thought it'd be good to look at what is a hero? Okay, what is it that makes someone a hero? And um, so I've got a quote from the Oxford Dictionary. So that says, um, a hero is a man or woman distinguished by the action of noble or courageous actions. Well, I think it can be more than that. I think it can also be people that we look up to, people we admire. And um, so it could be, it doesn't have to be someone who's done something particularly courageous, but it's someone that we maybe want to emulate and be like. We've got all kinds of heroes today. Um, you've got sporting heroes, you've got political heroes, you've got actors, singers, all things like that, people that you might look up to. It could be just people around you that you think are doing actually living life in a really good way. Um, I personally am a massive rugby fan. I love rugby. I play for Horsham. Um, and a hero for me, so a sporting hero for me, would be Johnny Wilkinson. I can still remember in 2003, um, that's, I think it's 17 seconds before the end of the, the World Cup final, he slotted a drop goal. And I, I remember going absolutely crazy with my brother in the front room. It was an absolutely amazing moment. And I've, I've always looked up to him. I think he's an amazing player and he's done a lot of good things as well. You might not, be, however, be a, a sporting fan, but maybe you're more into politics and, and kind of things around the world. So you might look up to someone maybe like Nelson Mandela, um, Gandhi, Greta Thunberg, who have all looked at kind of society around them and thought, something needs to change here, something needs to change. We need to do something different. This isn't right. Or you might see people around you and think, actually, I love the way that they're living their life. I wish I was more like them. I've actually, in preparation for this, had a look at kind of preachers and thought, what kind of things do they do? What do, what do they do? What can I learn from them? This is the only second time I've done it. What can I learn from people who are more experienced than me? So I've tried to take some of the good things, but I also noticed a few things that kind of um, made me laugh, and I don't think I necessarily need to take, but I wonder if you've noticed any of these as well. So one of the things I noticed was some of them have their own catchphrases. Some of them like to pretend they're pilots and go on a, a plane journey and so they can come in to, to land at the end of their preach. Others love to go on holiday and do lots of unpacking as they're going through, um, you know, just saying. Um, I was thinking as I was preparing for this, what is it then that makes Samson a hero? What is it that means he's recorded as a hero? Now, a lot of people know about Samson and they know that he was incredibly strong. He's known as one of the strongest people ever to have been alive. And I'm personally, I'm a massive fan of the Marvel films. I absolutely love them. Me and my wife have started going from start through to the end to try and watch them all through during lockdown. Um, and I think you could probably compare Samson to the Incredible Hulk. If there's anyone out there who hasn't seen any Marvel films or doesn't know who the Hulk is, he was a guy that was just incredibly strong, really muscly and loved to smash things, a bit of a hothead. And that's definitely what Samson was like. Samson was incredibly strong and a bit of a hothead. He's actually recorded as... Um, defeating a lion with his bare hands and killing a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone. Now that, for me, is a, is a real display of strength, you know, to defeat a thousand people with just a bone in your hand when they're armed with swords and knives and everything. I just think that's pretty, pretty impressive. Now in Hebrews, uh, Samson is recorded with people like Gideon, David and Samuel as a hero of the faith. And they're recorded as people that conquered kingdoms through faith. Okay, so... Despite his strength, I don't think that's what he was recorded as a hero for. It was his faith. Okay? Despite all the ways he screwed up in life, in the end, he showed faith. He showed faith in God. And that's why I think he is recorded as a hero of the faith. And that's what I want to be remembered for. Not my successes, not my accomplishments, not my messes I've made, but that actually, in the end, I was faithful and faith-filled. And that's what we're going to look at today. How God blessed Samson despite his flaws. He gave him back his strength and helped him achieve the, the thing that he called him to do all along. We're going to turn now to um, chapter 16 from Judges. Okay, you can read about Samson in chapters 13 to 16. We're going to focus on chapter 16 today. I'm just going to read some of that to you now. Starting at verse 4. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secrets of your strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, 
If anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then, with men hidden in the room, she called to Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, All this time you've been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, If you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So, while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric and tightened it with a pin. Again she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you? when you won't confide in me. This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with a silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now, the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, um, their God, and to celebrate saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now, the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more, and let me, be with, let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing against himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple and the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. So there's two main things that stood out to me when I was reading that story and when I was preparing. One of them is that Samson didn't really appear to have anyone around him to kind of guide him and give him advice and tell him when he was messing up. And the second is that even when we screw up, God can still redeem us. He can still make his plan happen. So I'm not sure about you, but while reading the story of Samson, I thought to myself, why does Samson keep making the same mistake? Why does he keep making the same stupid mistake over and over again? Surely he knew it was Delilah that was tying him up, and it surely he knew that it was her that was trying to take his strength away. I mean, every time he told her something that would take his strength away, miraculously that happened. Samson can't have been stupid enough to think it was some, just some sort of coincidence. He must have known it was her. So why did he stay with her? Why did he keep telling her these things? And why did he eventually actually tell her the truth? I believe that part of the reason is he didn't have anyone around him to, to give him a good old slap and say, Samson, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing this? In Proverbs 27, verse 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Samson needed the wounds of a friend to make him wake up and smell the roses. 
Okay, Delilah was manipulating him and looking to earn money from his downfall. Now, I don't imagine any of you are in a relationship where your partner wants to tie you up and sell you for silver. But you might be making the same mistakes over and over again. You might be in a cycle of committing the same sins, doing the same thing wrong over and over again. You might be able to relate to it in that way. Okay? You might be, maybe you're falling for the wrong person. You keep falling for the wrong person, someone that's just going to hurt you. Maybe you gossip about people behind their backs. Maybe you were looking at the wrong things online. Whatever it is, sometimes we just need a friend to tell us straight, stop it, you're better than that. And the Bible is really clear about us needing good people around us. In Proverbs 11, verse 14, it says, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counsellors, there is victory. And it goes on in Proverbs 12, 15 to say, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. For Samson, he thought what he was doing was right. Clearly to us, we can see that it was wrong. And often it is easier for people on the outside to see when things are going wrong, to see when we're stuck in that cycle. Sometimes we need someone there to tell us that we are doing the same thing over and over again. Now, if Samson did have people there, clearly he chose not to listen. And we need to learn from his mistake and make sure that when we've got those wise people around, when we've got the counsellors around us, that we actually listen to what they're telling us. Now, when I was a teenager, I was kind of in a cycle of making the same old mistakes over and over again. I kept doing the same thing. I knew it was wrong, and I knew I should stop. But I kind of almost wasn't sure that I really wanted to. Um, fortunately, at the time, I was meeting with a guy called Angus Hogg. He's a guy that I really respect. Um, he's a really great guy, and I still look up to him now. He's also a really straight-talking guy. He will not um, pander around the subject. He will tell you straight. And that's exactly what I needed. He told me what, what I was doing was wrong. And he helped me to break free of it. I actually remember one time he said to me, Rob, what you were doing is wrong. Stop it. He was really straight and to the point. And that was great. That was exactly what I needed. But I want to ask you, have you got someone like that with you? Have you got people around you that can challenge you? So I don't meet with Angus anymore, but my, my wife is awesome at this. We, we look at challenging each other and helping each other to be the people we're meant to be. And she actually did that for me when I was preparing for today. So it was a few weeks ago, Andy asked me to speak, and I, I knew it was coming up, I knew how to prepare for it, and then some of my friends messaged me and said, do you want to come and play some sport? Do you want to come and do some socially distance sport? And Ruth said to me, are you giving yourself enough time pre to prepare for Sunday? Are you going to regret not spending time on it? Now, the truth is, I did have enough time to do both, and I was able to go, but that challenge was exactly what I needed. So that day when I put my daughter Esther down for a nap, I picked up my Bible, I started reading, and I prayed, and I asked God what he wanted me to speak about. If I hadn't had that challenge for Ruth, I probably wouldn't have done that. I probably would have procrastinated, and if I'm honest, probably would have spent the time playing on my phone. So if you don't have an Angus or a Ruth, I'd really encourage you to try and find someone like that. Get them around you. Get someone who can give you that wise counsel. But I want to be really clear as well. Although Angus and Ruth did challenge me, they also really championed me. They praised me when I was doing things right. Okay, you don't need someone that's just going to point out the things, your mistakes. You don't need someone that's just going to say, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, and putting you down. You don't need someone who's going to try and keep you down. You need someone who sees the greatness in you and tries to challenge you and call that greatness out and help you become the person that you were created to be. And the great thing is, however much we do mess up, God can fix our mess. Okay? God is our greatest champion. He's our greatest supporter. He loves us so much. And not only can he fix our mess, he can turn our mess into something good. And that is incredible. He can fix the mess we make and turn it into something good. Now, Samson had a massive call on his life. If you read in chapter 13, an angel came to his mum and said, you're going to give birth to Samson. Now, that would be quite exciting in and of itself, but she was actually barren, so she wasn't expecting to have any, any kids. So this was a completely new thing for her. It was really exciting. But more than just that, he didn't just declare that Samson was going to be born. He declared that Samson was going to free the, the, the nation of Israel from the Philistines. Now, that is a pretty huge calling. Your son is going to free the entire nation of Israel. That's not a small thing. That's a big deal. Now, you might think ordinarily, someone with a call like that in their life would know exactly what they should do from day to day. They're the kind of person, because they've got such a big call in their life, I bet they spend so much time in prayer. I bet they spend so much time asking God the way they should go, asking God about the decisions they would make. Well, as we read earlier, that was not Samson. Samson wasn't that guy. He was not your perfect candidate. In fact, John Stott describes Samson as an adolescent exhibitionist. 
That doesn't sound like the kind of guy you'd expect to have a big call that's going to be a nation-saving call. Kind of reading through the, the story of Samson, it's obvious that he had one main weakness. Okay? The hero's kryptonite in this story seem to be pretty women and bouts of anger. In chapter 14, we read that Samson falls for a daughter of the Philistines. So he decides that he wants to marry this, this woman just from seeing her across a field. He's like, that's the woman I want. Now, what he didn't do, he didn't go to God and said, is this the woman for me? Is this the woman that's going to help me with my call? No, he thought, that woman's hot. I want to marry her. Okay? And he, it actually turns out that at their wedding, she betrays him to the Philistines. And Samson shows this weakness again later on. So before we read in chapter 16, it tells us that he goes to Gaza and sleeps with a prostitute. And we all read together the mess that he caused himself with Delilah. He did not learn from his early mistakes. He did not learn from the mistake he made in chapter 14 um, by going after someone that wasn't right for him. And he made that same exact mistake in chapter 16 with Delilah. Now, this results in Samson losing his strength and being captured by the Philistines. Samson is now at an all-time low. He's chained up, weak, blind to have his eyes gouged out. He was called to save the nation of Israel from Philistine, but now he is their prisoner. If ever there was a man to screw up his calling on his life, it was Samson. So why then do we remember him? And why is he written in Hebrews as being a hero of the faith? I believe it's because of how he responded in that moment. He turned to God and he prayed. This is where he showed his greatest faith. He couldn't rely on his own strength. All his life, he'd relied on his strength to get himself out of his mess. He couldn't do that anymore. He knew that he had nothing left to give. And he turned to God and said, I need your help. God, please help me. He cried out. And what did God do? Did he say, sorry, mate, you've had your chances. I'm leaving you where you are. No, he didn't. He stepped in and God restored his strength and gave him the opportunity to see his calling come true by defeating the laws of the Philistines in one strike. As Timothy Keller puts it, Samson was a flawed and sinful man that God used for tremendous purposes. More than that, Samson points us to the ultimate hero, Jesus Christ, who, unlike Samson, did not slay his enemies, but through sacrificial love, turned his persecutor into friends. So like Samson, we were flawed. We were sinful. We were sinful men and women. But God stepped in, sacrificing his own son so that we could change from enemies of God to friends of God. And what a great position that is to be. We are friends with the creator of the, and sustainer of the entire universe. How great is that? It's amazing. It's such a privilege to be in this situation. Some of you might feel, though, that you're more like Samson, chained up because of the mistakes you've made. You may not feel like you're God's friend. You may feel like you're chained up. Some of you may think that actually you're as far away from your calling as you possibly could be. Or you might not know what your calling is, but think, how can my calling be great? God would not choose someone like me to do something great. I've made such a mess of my life. Surely God's not going to choose me. There's nothing you, I can do to fix it. And you may feel like that. And I felt a bit like that when I was at university. So before university, um, I was going to church. I was going to youth group and all that sort of stuff. Then I went away to university and I was not a very self, self-confident kind of guy. I was really self-conscious and I was really worried about what other people thought of me. And I actually cared more about what people thought of me than I did God. I ended up giving up on God, no longer chasing after him and the things he had for me. And I actually started chasing after girls. Um, I will say there was probably more chasing than catching. Um, I was more of a king of the friend zone than I I was anything else. Um, But God stepped in. He took me where I I was in my position of feeling there was surely God's not going to use me anymore. I've I've given up on him. Surely he's given me up, up on me too. But he didn't. He stepped in and he lifted me up. He set me on the right path. I would not be here today if God had given up on me. And I want to, it's, it's so good because God can do the same thing for you. However bad you feel, however much you feel you've messed up, God can restore you. And I want to read this verse to you. When I found this verse, oh, I love this one. So it's from Isaiah 44, verse 22. It says, I have swept away your offences like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. God has said it there in the Bible. He has redeemed you. Okay, however bad you felt, he has redeemed you. So Samson was flawed, and he actually broke all three parts of his Nazarite vow. So it says in the story that he was a Nazarite. That means he made a vow which contained three things. The first one was that he would never touch dead bodies. We saw from the story, and we know from the rest of his story, he definitely did touch dead bodies. Okay, He said he would never drink, and we can read in the story that he did. 
It also said that he would never cut his hair. Well, by telling Delilah that, that was going to remove his, his strength, he allowed that to happen. So he was part of that happening as well. He broke all three parts of his vow. Now, you may, feel, you may be flawed and you may feel like you're sinful like Samson, but God still wants to use you. God hasn't given up on you, okay? God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And if you don't know him, then you can. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know God and you want to today, you can know him today. And the great thing is there's not a big thing that you have to do. You just have to repent. And what that means is you have to say sorry and turn back to follow God. Okay, now, if you would like some prayer and some help with that, then Andy and Hazel are going to tell you how to do that at the end. Okay, and it's also, but if, you're, if you are already a Christian, but you feel like you've messed up and you need some prayer as well, then you can do that as well. We've got a team ready. They'd love to pray with you. They'd love to help you. So get that prayer. Ask for that prayer. Make that step today. Now, the story doesn't stop there. And uh, as I said, I'm a Marvel fan, so I'm going to give a bit of a spoiler alert here. If you've not seen Endgame, I'm sorry, I'm going to ruin the ending for you. Um, I said at the beginning that Samson was kind of like the Incredible Hulk. Well, I think in the end, he shows himself more to be like Iron Man. He wasn't perfect, but in the end, he sacrificed himself. He sacrificed himself. So Iron Man sacrifices himself to save the universe. Samson sacrificed himself to save his people. So even when Samson had maybe given up himself, God didn't give up on him. Okay? And God hasn't given up on you. We have a mission too. As, a Christian, as Christians, we have a mission. We are called to change the world. The thought of that may sound scary and it may sound big, but it's true. Okay? I'm not lying to you, it's true. It's in the Bible, I'm going to read it to you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to reserve all that I've commanded you. So I read that from Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. And in it, Jesus tells us that we need to go and make disciples of all nations, not in all nations. Now, you might sit there and think, what's the difference, Rob? How is that any different? What's the difference between of and in? Well, the difference is, if we make disciples of nations, then you've got an entire nation following God, rather than just a few people in that nation following God. Imagine the impact it could have if we as a people, as a family, as a church, started to believe that as the truth. If we started to believe that that great commission is for us. Imagine if we actually believed that we can make a difference. Imagine, if we, imagine the difference that would happen if we went out and believed that was true for us. So imagine how different England would be if everyone in it was a Christian, everyone in it followed Jesus. Just picture that now. How different would England be if everyone followed Jesus? Now, we need to stop, stop thinking that our mistakes and our messes disqualify us from the Great Commission. Let me be a straight-talking friend for you now. Stop it. Stop disqualifying yourself. Okay? Your circumstances, your messes, the things you've done, don't disqualify you. Samson almost let his mess disqualify him. Don't let, let you do that. Okay, but he decided to put a stake in the ground. He put a stake in the ground and said, I've made this mess, but today this changes. Okay? Today, you can make the same decision. Today, you can choose to stop thinking of the Great Commission as too great, too big, too much, and start thinking it as how great, how awesome, how amazing that I get to be a part of this. How great will it be when you see your friends at work saved? How great will it be when you see your family member saved? How great would it be when you see that mum at the school gate saved? How great would it be when your childhood friend that you've been praying diligently for years and years and years gets saved? How great will that be? That's the great commission. It's not too great. It is great to be a part of. No, I said earlier, it seems kind of big and kind of scary. Yeah, it is. That's the truth. It is big. It's a big call. It's scary. But... This is where we find our strength. The end of verse 20 says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us. He is with you at work. He is with you at the school gate. He is with you when you go into town. He is with you at home. He is with you when you're with your friends and family. He is always with you. You are never alone. It may feel overwhelming, but you are not alone. You don't have to do this alone. Jesus is with you every step. And so are we. We are a church family. We are called to do this together. We are in this together. We are never alone. Now, I absolutely love LifeSpring. I love this church. I'm so happy to be a part of it. It's a real blessing to me. But one of the things I think we are missing is regular salvation. 
Now, I think some of that is because many of us have probably disqualified ourselves from making disciples, whether it be because we've messed up or we think we're just not quite good enough a Christian, um, or maybe we just keep making the same mistakes like Samson, or if we're honest with ourselves, maybe we think it's someone else's responsibility to do it. None of those reasons actually disqualify you. Okay? Jesus didn't tell us to be perfect and then make disciples. He told us to go and do it. Okay? We don't have to be perfect to do it. Now, I'm sure we all want to see salvation, but how many of us are actually out there fighting for it? Now, you may think to yourself, but Rob, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not called to be an evangelist. That's fine. You don't have to be. You don't have to be an evangelist to pray for your friend for one minute a day. You don't have to be an evangelist to show someone that you love them. You don't have to be an evangelist that when the opportunity arises to share your personal story, you don't have to be an evangelist to do that. But if we all choose to do that, if we all decide today that we are going to do that, we will see more salvation. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was preparing this, I was really challenged. I felt God say to me, I see that you've got a heart for the set to see the lost saved, but what are you doing about it? That kind of hit me because I realised the answer is I'm not doing enough. But like Samson, I want to put a stake in the ground today and say, regardless of what I've done in the past, when I've not done enough, today, with God's help, things change. And I want to invite you to do the same as well. From today, things can be different. So let's be like Samson. When Samson was at his very weakest, he turned to God and God gave him his strength. So when we feel what we are at our very weakest, turn to God and he will give you strength. I want to give you a verse just before I pray to finish. And I want you to remember this when you feel weak. It's Isaiah 40 verse 29. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. So when you feel weak, remember that. I'm just going to pray for us now before we, before we finish. Father, I thank you that you are always with us. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you sent your son to die for us so that we could be lifted out of the mess that we have made for ourselves. I thank you that you do not make us pay for our sins, but you paid the price. You took the, the, the weight on, on your shoulders as you sat on that cross so that we could be forgiven, so that we could step into the destiny that you have for us, so that we could step into the greatness that you've called to us to be. I thank you that each one of us are called to greatness. I thank you that each one of us is called to be part of the Great Commission, to see great things happen. And Father, today we put a stake in the ground and say, what we've done in the past will not happen again. We move forward with you, Lord. We follow you. We put a stake in the ground and say, today things change. And I thank you, Father, that you give us the strength to do that when we feel weak. Amen. Amen.